This is ChestertonRadio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Tom Wilkins of Amalgamated Life, Johnny. Oh, hi, Tom. What's up? Well, at the moment, 50000 bucks worth of life insurance. Oh? Yeah, we got a policy for that amount in the life of one Edward Russell. Russell? Never heard of him. That's just the trouble, Johnny. Right now, nobody else has either. Three days ago, his wife, Leona, over in Denver, filed a missing persons report. She the beneficiary? Right. So what do you want from me? <laughs> Find out what happened to him. Well, how do you know anything did? Maybe he just walked out on his wife. Now, from what I can gather, Russell was a hothead. Could be he had one argument too many. Uh, it still could be just a guy getting away for a while. Huh? And why would he abandon his car in his storage garage in Colorado Springs? Oh. Yeah. It turned up this morning with part of his luggage in it. Interested? I'm on my way. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account item one, $120.50, plane fare and incidentals to Denver. Tom Wilkins hadn't given me much to go on, so I figured the logical place to start was with the missing man's wife, Leona Russell. Their house was in a moderately prosperous suburb of Denver, a white ranch house with a shake roof. Everything looked neat and well kept. But somehow, a forlorn feeling came through to me about the place. Then the door opened. And right away, I was sure something pretty bad had happened to Edward Russell. You don't just walk out on a wife who looked like that. Yes. Mrs. Leona Russell? Yes. I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Wilkins sent a telegram about you. Won't you come in? Thanks. Hmm, cooler in here. I try to keep the house shut up during the day. It helps. Please sit down. Oh, thank you. I've already told the police what little there was to tell when I filed the... the missing persons report. Oh, sure. This is just a routine investigation, Mrs. Russell. You probably don't feel too much like talking about it, but if you wouldn't mind going over what information there is again... Well, it was just a week ago that Ed, Mr. Russell, left. You were here when he left? Yes. He told me he was driving up to Boulder on business, that... He'd only be gone overnight. Oh, what sort of business is he in? He's in real estate. Boulder, huh? But his car was found in Colorado Springs. I know. I can't explain that. When he didn't come home on time, I got worried. I'd call the hotel in Boulder. He never checked in there. Yes, I see. Did he know anyone in Colorado Springs? Just business contacts, as far as I know. He might have decided to go there instead of Boulder, but he would have called me. But he didn't? No. I I haven't heard a thing from him since he drove away from here a week ago. Mrs. Russell, do you happen to know if your husband had any, well, enemies? No. Ed was pretty impulsive, you might even say hot-headed. But I just can't believe that anyone would hate him enough to... to do anything to him. Well, we don't know that anyone has. I know. <laughs> it's funny, the things that run through your mind at a time like this. Uh-huh. What sort of things? It sounds funny, but I've almost been wishing it was in an accident or something like that. In a hospital where he might not have a chance to call me, but at least was safe and alive. You've checked the hospitals? All of them. I did that before I filed the missing persons report. Tell me, had your husband been unusually depressed before he left? If you're suggesting that Ed did away with himself, that's just not possible, Mr. Dollar. That's one thing he'd never do. He, he just wasn't built that way. Mm -hmm. Everything was uh, fine between you two. Yes. Oh, of course, we had disagreements, arguments in the six years we've been married. Who hasn't? Uh, but nothing serious. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm not being very helpful to you, Mr. Dollar. Well, I'm sure that's not your fault. You've no idea at all where he could be then or what could have happened. No, none at all. Except... Except what? Well, 
I don't know if it means anything or not, but I, uh, I found this under some of Bill's papers on his desk just this morning. Travel folder. Crystal Lake. Where's that? It's a resort up in the mountains. As I say, I, I don't know whether it means anything or not. Has he ever been there before? Well, not that I know of. Or mention it to you? No, I don't. I'm sure he hasn't. Well, I'll check it out. Thanks, Mrs. Russell. Oh, just one more thing. Yes? You're the beneficiary of his life insurance policy? Yes. I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar. I'm not thinking anything. I'm just asking questions. It's my job. I know. But let me ask you a question, Mr. Dollar. Do you think $50,000 or any amount of money could possibly make up for... for Ed? One thing about my job, you have to ask such nice questions sometimes. After Leona Russell's answer, there didn't seem to be much left to say, so I told her I'd let her know if I found out anything and I left. I looked at the travel folder again. Crystal Lake, pretty slim lead. But when you have nothing to go on, anything at all looks promising. Expense account item two, $45.20. I rented a car and drove to Crystal Lake. It was a beautiful spot. 7,000 feet high, clean, thin air, fragrant pines, and the clearest water this side of the Jackson Hole country. I parked a moment and looked out over the lake. Oh, great place to drop a hook. But I had a strong hunch that the fishing I'd be doing was of a little different variety. One thing was obvious, there was a lot of money up here. Most of the cabins would be in cellar to be called cabins and had their own boat landings. The village was nestled at one end of the lake, a colorful collection of Swiss chalets. I headed for the office of the local law, a deputy sheriff named Ansel Garrett. Tall, thin, raw-boned lad in his early 30s who looked like he'd spent all but the first few hours of his life in the open. Clear, keen eyes that showed he had his wits about him. Have a seat, Dollar. Thanks. Uh, Edward Russell, you said. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Disappeared about a week ago. Left home in Denver. Hasn't been heard from since. So? So he could have come here. His wife found a travel folder about Crystal Lake in his papers. That's uh, supposed to prove something? No, it doesn't prove anything, Ants, but it's my only lead. Here, take a look at this picture. Hmm. You recognize him? Yeah, looks sort of familiar. You've seen him up here at Crystal Lake? Yeah, I think so. Four or five days ago. Well, what do you know? Looks like my luck's changing. I hit the jackpot on my first nickel. Well, it depends on what jackpot you're talking about, Johnny. What do you mean? Well, for one thing, I could be wrong about the identification. <laughs> I guess you haven't been wrong about many of them in your time. Uh, I suppose he was the guy. So what? Why are you looking for him, anyway? Mainly to find out if he's still alive. <laughs> what makes you think he's not? Nothing definite. But a hunch that's getting stronger by the minute. Oh? Insurance investigators are operating on hunches these days, huh? Once in a while. Just like deputy sheriff says. Yeah, all right. So hunches sometimes do pan out. But you could be way out in the pasture, Johnny. Maybe the guy just had an argument with his wife and he walked out on Oh, her. sure, yeah, I thought of that. But then I saw his wife. Nobody in his right mind would walk out on her. Mm, like that, huh? Like that. Look, Ants, can you give me any dope on this guy? No, not much. He came to see me about five days ago. Why? Mainly to ask me a silly question. Silly? Yeah. He asked me if there was a guy named Bill around Crystal Lake somewhere. Oh, I take it there's more than one. A fistful, Johnny. Bill Cullen, who tends bar at the hotel. Bill Jensen, who runs the boathouse. Bill Pickens, who clerks at the hardware. Yeah, okay, Bi okay, I get the idea. I take it Russell didn't know which Bill he wanted, huh? Nope. Well, at least I know he was here at Crystal Lake now. You, uh, you haven't seen him since, huh? You know, just once. Oh? That same night. He was in the bar at the hotel talking to Betty Norton. Who's she? Heiress to the Norton estate. Mining. She's got a big place on the other side of the lake near Lookout Point. Know anything about her? Phew, all I want to. Oh. She travels at a pretty good clip. Oh, I see. Well, thanks for the information, Ace. You know, what are you going to do now? Try to find Edward Russell. Alive or otherwise. That uh, hunch of yours still operating? It hasn't gotten any weaker. Oh, uh, just one thing, Johnny. Mm. This is a pretty high-grade resort here. Things are nice and peaceful. I, uh, I like to keep it that way. Sure. So, so don't go off half-cocked, huh? For instance? For instance, don't start accusing anybody of murder unless or until you find a body. <laughs> and if I do find a body? 
Oh, then looks like we'll have to start doing a little accusing. I left Ansel Garrett's office and walked around the village. All I knew so far was that Edward Russell, or somebody who looked like him, had been in Crystal Lake several days ago inquiring about a man named Bill, and that he'd been at the bar with a dough-heavy girl named Betty Norton. There were a flock of Bills in town, but there was only one Betty Norton, so I decided to start with her. I drove around the lake to her home, an elaborate lodge-type place that sprawled along the shore. Betty was down on her boat dock in a bathing suit, and she was a pretty elaborate-looking job herself. I was just going for a swim. Come on, join me. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Norton. I'm not equipped at the moment. Oh, there's some trunks in the dressing room. Yeah, well, look, I'd like to talk to you about something, But so... I don't feel like talking right now. I feel like swimming. But this is important. It's about... So is swimming. If you want to talk to me, you've got to go swimming first. <sighs> okay, we'll play it your way. That's the only way I ever play it, Mr. Dollar. So we went swimming, and I swam hard, but mainly to keep from freezing to death. The water should have been accused by the feel of it, but Betty seemed to think it was normal. After a while, we climbed back onto the wind. Wonderful, huh? Ooh. Here's a towel. Oh, it's great, sure. Only about 20 degrees, too cold. <laughs> Makes the sun feel better. Yeah. Hot and cold, Johnny. Contrast. Hmm. That's what puts the charge in life. Is it? I wouldn't know. Hey, look, do you mind now if I ask you a couple of questions? Go ahead. You know a man named Edward Russell? I don't think so. I think you do. You had a drink with him at the hotel several nights ago. So this I do once in a while. Am I supposed to remember all of them? This one might have mentioned he was looking for a guy named Bill. Well, I remember now. He thought the bartender might be the one he was looking for, Bill Collins. So what happened? How should I know? I left. You haven't seen Russell since? Nope. Haven't missed him either. Oh, great. And for this kind of information, I practically freeze to death in the ice trough you laughingly call a lake. <laughs> Maybe your trip wasn't a waste of time after all, Johnny. No. We met. Well, uh... What do you do with your spare time? <laughs> well, A, I don't expect to have much, and B, isn't that sort of a leading question? Mm, I'm pretty good at leading. You must have trouble finding guys to dance with, huh? Why don't you try it sometime? Huh? left on that, feeling like a fly who spotted the web at the last moment. And right now, I was feeling just about as useless as a fly, too. I wasn't getting even close to locating Edward Russell. I went back to my room and the phone was ringing. Johnny Dollar. Yeah, it's Garrett, Johnny. Sheriff's office. Oh, hi. Well, you can quit looking for Russell. We found him. Well, that's good news. Is it? He's dead. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a cabin with a lovely view of a beautiful lake. A nice, comfortable, quiet spot for murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Wright. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. This is ChestertonRadio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hey, it's Garrett, Johnny, Sheriff's Office. You can quit looking for Edward Russell. We found him. Well, that's good news. Is it? He's dead. What? Yeah, been dead for three or four days. 
Where'd you find him? In a cabin on the other side of the lake. Your hunch was good. And expensive. What do you mean? It'll cost the company I represent a cool $50,000. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item three, $2.55. Telegram to Tom Wilkins of Amalgamated Life Associates notifying him of Edward Russell's murder. I was reasonably sure the telegram wouldn't make Tom sleep any easier. I headed for the office of Ansel Garrett, deputy sheriff in charge of the Crystal Lake substation. Sit down. Not good, huh, Johnny? No, not good. Not good at all. Who found the body, Ansel? A fellow named Bixby's waiting next door. I figured you'd want to talk to him. Thanks, I do. First, though, I'd, uh, I'd like you to run over what you know about this deal again for me. I want to know just where we stand in it. People at this resort pay a lot of money for peace and quiet. I don't want to disturb it any more than I can help. Good luck. The meaning? Meaning if you know where you stand in this deal, you're a lot better off than I am, and I've got a strong hunch a lot of peace and quiet's going to get disturbed before it's wound up. I don't like your hunches, Johnny. you got a way of proving out. <laughs> like the one about Russell being dead. I suppose you give me the rundown. Okay, okay. And I can make it short because there's not much to tell. The company I represent holds a $50,000 policy on Russell. About a week ago, he disappeared. And his wife filed a missing persons report? Yeah, Leona Russell over in Denver. Mm. She said her husband had told her he was going on an overnight business trip to Boulder. He never came back. His car was found in a garage in Colorado Springs. And his wife couldn't account for it? No. She said she was completely in the dark. I take it she's his beneficiary. Oh, yeah, sure. I thought of that, too. I asked her about it. What kind of an answer did you get? Tears, mostly. And a pretty withering look. Either she's completely clean or she's one of the best actresses I've ever seen. The rest of the story you told me. How Russell came into your offices several days ago looking for a guy named Bill, last name and description unknown. You know, like I said, there's a flock of Bills in this neck of the woods. Yeah, no. The bartender, the man who runs the boathouse, a clerk in the hardware store, a few assorted others. Mm. I uh, told you I saw Russell having a drink with Betty Norton the same night he came to see me. You check her out? Yeah, yeah. I had to go swimming with her in that sub-zero lake before she'd answer any questions, though. Then what I got from her was nothing. She said she'd met Russell at the hotel, had a drink with him, then left. That's all you've got, huh? That's it. Well, that's precious little to go on. I'll let you talk to Mr. Bixby. Oh, Mr. Bixby, would you step in here, please? This is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Mr. Clarence Bixby. Hi. How are you? Not too good at the moment. <laughs> you got troubles. It was my cabin the body was in. Oh. The padlock had been changed, Johnny. Here it is. No fingerprints other than Bixby's. I monkeyed with it for a while until I realized my key wouldn't fit, and then I pried it open with a big screwdriver. Mr. Bixby, would you mind showing me your cabin and just what happened? I guess not. Doesn't matter much now, anyway. What do you mean? Well, I was going to show the cabin to a guy when we found the body. He wanted to buy the place. But who'd want to buy it now? Bixby and I drove halfway around the lake. His cabin was a couple of hundred feet from the edge and had a good view of the water. Well, nice spot here, Bixby. It was. You use the cabin much? Yeah, I haven't been able to regularly for the last couple of years. So I got to figure and why I keep on paying for taxes and upkeep on it. So I decided to sell it. Did you advertise it in the papers? I did. And first crack out of the box, I got a hot prospect. He's the one you brought up here to show the cabin to. That's right. His name's Putnam. Putnam. I'd like to talk to him. Yeah, he's staying at the hotel. Probably looking for another cabin to buy. Yeah, here we are. Oh. Well, let's see. This is where the padlock was, huh? That was the first thing I noticed, that the padlock had been changed. The one I had on there was better. Whoever did it probably pried the first one off. And yeah, right here is where I, I pried off the lock this morning. Mm -hmm. Then what? 
And I opened the door. The body was on the floor right over here. Bullet hole in the forehead. I see. Putnam turned green, and I... Well, that's not a very pretty sight to find in your own cabin. No. Well, let's go sit outside. The dead man, Edward Russell. Did you happen to know him, Bixby? No. Never set eyes on him before. Why did they have to pick my cabin? <laughs> That's a good question. Hey, that cabin about 100 yards away, who lives there? Oh, that one? Owned by the Butler family. They spend their summers up here. Oh, maybe they saw or heard something. No, Deputy Sheriff questioned them. They arrived here three days ago. He figured that was the morning after the killing. I see. Have a cigar? No, no thanks. What does it add up to, Dollar? Well, at the moment, Mr. Bixby, not much. I sat there and watched Bixby tie his cellophane cigar wrapper into a neat little knot. And I realized that was exactly my situation at the moment. The whole deal was a knot, and I didn't know how to untie it. I went back to the hotel. Item four, an expense account, $1.75. Telephone call to the dead man's wife, Leona Russell, over in Denver. It was very considerate of you to telephone, Mr. Dollar. The authorities notified me of what happened... They want me to come up there and confirm the identification. I see. You don't think it could be somebody else? Mm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Russell. I'm afraid not. I guess I'd really given up hoping. All the time I was trying to tell myself he was alive, but... Um, yes, yes. Um, look, Mrs. Russell, have you ever heard of a man named Clarence Bixby? Bixby? No. Your husband was found in Bixby's cabin... Did you ever hear him mention the name? No. Okay. Thanks anyway. I'll keep in touch. I hung up and sat there a moment, thinking her over. She stood to benefit to the tune of $50,000 by her husband's death. She seemed on the up and up, and yet... Expense account item five, another call to Denver, to the police department. I wanted them to check, check on her, but I found out that they and Ansel Garrett working together were a couple of jumps ahead of me. They'd already checked on Leona and established the fact that at the time of her husband's murder here at Crystal Lake, she'd been in Denver. I decided to look up Putnam, the man who'd wanted to buy Russell's cabin. I found him in the bar at the hotel. Yes, I tell you, it was quite a shock, Mr. Dollar. When Bixby opened his cabin door, the body sprawled there in front of us. It... <sighs> yes, sir, quite a shock. Yeah. How come you decided to buy Bixby's cabin, Mr. Putnam? Well, my wife and I had been on the lookout for a cabin for some time. When I saw Bixby's ad in the paper, it sounded like just the sort of place I was looking for. I see. So I answered the ad, made the arrangements with Bixby to come up here and have him show me the place. Mm hmm. Are you still interested in buying a cabin up here? Well, possibly. I've always wanted a place where I can come for rest now and then, but after what's happened, I don't think I'd be too happy in Bixby's place. Mr. Putnam, the dead man's name was Edward Russell. Did, uh, did you happen to know him? Of course not. Why? Ever hear of him before? See here, Mr. Dollar, what is your reason for asking questions like that? Surely you don't think I'm involved in any of this? No, routine, Mr. Putnam. Well, I don't care for the routine, Mr. Dollar. Well, look, I would... Skip it. See you later, Putnam. What pulled me into action was a glimpse I caught of the bartender. I started remembering a few things. Number one, Edward Russell had been looking for a guy named Bill. Number two, the bartender was one of several guys by that name here at Crystal Lake. Number three, something I saw on the bartender's face made me think he could be the bill that Russell had been looking for. I left Putnam's table and slid onto a stool at the bar. Hi. Hi. What'll it be? Is, uh, is that I.W. Harper there? Yeah. And soda, please. Coming up. Sort of quiet this evening, huh? Yeah, yeah. Been a little slack this season so far. I imagine it'll pick up later on this summer. Here. There you are. Thanks. Must have been quite a fight. Come again? You're wearing what looks like the tail end of a black eye. Oh, hear that. No, I, I bent down to pick up a bottle of mix the other day, and I bumped my face on the coin of the bar. You're uh, sure that's the way it happened, huh? Where are you getting at, pal? Better take a look at my card. Insurance investigator? Yeah. A guy named Edward Russell was in here a few nights ago with Betty Norton. He was looking for someone named Bill. By some strange coincidence, your name is Bill. And by an even stranger coincidence, you've got a black eye. Okay, Dollar. So Russell did give me the black eye. 
I traded him a split lip for it. What happened? I still haven't figured it out. He was in here drinking. He started talking to Miss Norton. She called me by my first name, and suddenly this Russell heats up. He comes up to me and starts asking me a bunch of questions. What kind of questions? Well, mainly had I ever lived in Denver. I told him no, but he didn't seem to believe me. Got pretty insulting, and we ended up outside. He pasted me first, and I let him have one. Then I spotted the hotel manager and broke it off. They left right after that. Well, why the cover-up about hitting your face on the bar? Are you kidding? Look, how long do you think a bartender would last in a hotel like this if the management knew he got in a fight with a customer? Particularly if the customer winds up dead, huh? Yeah, I heard about the killing this afternoon. Tough, but I must say that guy was asking for trouble. I don't know what was eating him, but something sure was. You didn't see him after that night? No. Check on me if you want. Oh, don't worry, I will. I... Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? You said something a minute ago that just rang a bell. You said they left together after the fight. Who's they? Russell and Miss Norton. You sure about that? You sure she was with him when he left? Sure, I'm sure. You don't miss any tricks about a guy like that. Hey, look. If she told you different, I don't want to get nobody in trouble. That's where you and I differ, Bill. There's one person I want to get in trouble real bad. Who? The person who killed Russell. And right now, Betty Norton looked like an interesting possibility. I went outside and started walking along the lakeshore in the moonlight, thinking about it. She told me she'd left alone after one drink with Russell. But according to the bartender, she'd lied. She and Russell had left together. The motive stumped me, though. As far as I could figure, Leona Russell was the only one who could profit by her husband's death. Yet she didn't kill him. But Betty Norton, the girl who always had to play everything her way... I decided to have another talk with her and turned to go back to the hotel, and I stopped. Out of the corner of my eye, I'd seen a movement near a tree on the slope above me. A shadow where there shouldn't have been a shadow. I scrambled up the slope. But there was nobody in sight. So somebody was keeping an eye on me. Somebody who knew this area pretty well. A nasty thought started pecking away at me. To wit, in getting closer to Russell's killer, I might be getting closer to something else, too. A bullet. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a girl who lied and a padlock that didn't. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. You are listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Betty Norton. I've been trying to call you. I know. I was out. I'm sorry. You keep pretty late hours. It's after midnight. Did I wake you up? No. Good. Why don't you come over? The moon's real nice tonight. The lake is luscious. I'll come over, Betty. But not to talk about the moon or the water. Got something else on your mind, maybe? Yeah. A little thing called murder.
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item six, two dollars. Tip to the Crystal Lake Hotel garage attendant for rousting him out of bed to get my car. I wanted very much to have another talk with Betty Norton, the wealthy, glamorous girl on the other side of the lake. She had told me she hadn't been with Edward Russell when he left the hotel bar the night he was murdered. But the bartender at the hotel swore that she and Russell had left together. If she'd lied about that, maybe she'd lied about a few other things. When I got to her Lakeshore mansion, she had a few well-spaced dim lights burning, a dreamy-type record playing, and some drinks mixed. The whole bit. Here you are, Johnny. Bourbon, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, you've got a good memory, Betty. Sure. I always remember what's important. Or what you want to remember. Same thing. Is it? How about the things you don't want to remember? Meaning? A couple of questions I want to ask you. Oh, now don't start making with those dull questions again. Look, let's just have a drink. <laughs> Last time I had to go swimming with you before you'd answer. This time it's got to be a drink, huh? Well, I thought we might dance, too. With you leading, I suppose. Sorry, Betty. I know you probably own quite a few things in this world, but the list stopped short of me. I want some answers from you, and I want them now. Okay, so be a party pooper. So ask questions. You told me you met Edward Russell in the hotel bar the night he was murdered. You had one drink with him and left. That's right. You lied, Betty. Who says so? The bartender at the hotel. My, and I've always tipped him so well, too. Look, baby, suppose we cut the comic routines, huh? All right, so I left the bar with Russell. Why did you lie about it to me this afternoon? It's very simple, Johnny. Part of the Norton training, I guess. What does that mean? My father told me long ago I could do whatever I liked, but to keep it out of the newspapers. That's the way I've played it ever since. Well, go on. On that night you're talking about, Russell and the bartender got into a fight. I know. And that's why I lied to you. Believe me. I just didn't want to be mixed up in anything that could land in the papers. I see. What happened then? He and I went to a coffee shop to sober him up a little. You can check that. I will. Then what? He kept mumbling about somebody named Billy was looking for he say much about him? No, he wasn't making very much sense. And then Hiram came into the coffee shop. Who? Hiram, the old fellow who drives what passes for a taxi here at the lake. He told Russell somebody wanted to see him. Russell left with Hiram. And you didn't see Russell after that? No, I didn't. You don't look convinced, Johnny. I'm not. You lied once before, you could be lying again. Sorry. I told you I lied before, but this time it's the truth. Mm hmm we're going to get in touch with Hiram. His number's on the cover of the local directory. Local directory. This one over here? Yes. Okay. Johnny, at this time of night? Yes, at this time of night. He doesn't usually take calls after midnight. Mm. Uh, sleep around somewhere, I guess. Well, I'll check him in the morning. What is it? Shh, quiet. Johnny, what is it? What's the matter? I thought I heard something outside here. Could it have been one of your servants? Well, I only have a housekeeper with me here, and she went to bed hours ago. Hmm. There are a lot of deer around here. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, maybe. Johnny, you call Hiram in the morning. He'll back my story up. It's crazy thinking I had anything to do with Russell's murder. What possible reason could I have? A pretty weird one, maybe, but it might fit. You told me this afternoon you had to play everything your way. You've probably been doing it most of your life and getting away with it. Maybe Russell wouldn't cooperate. Are you kidding? Look, men like Russell are a dime a dozen. So I had a drink with him and got mixed up in a barroom brawl. I should have known better. But as far as getting interested in him, I wasn't. Believe me, I can always find others who like to... Play it my way, as you put it. 
What's the matter? Oh, you kill me. That gold-plated front you put on. I wonder if behind it you aren't just a hollow, lonely kid. Thanks a lot for reminding me, Mr. Freud. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I guess that was a little out of line. I guess I was asking for it. But you're wrong about me not being able to stand anyone who doesn't play it my way. You see, I found someone who won't. And I kind of like it. Kind of like you, that is. Um, <clears throat> yeah, look, uh, oh, I guess better... Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to try to appropriate you or, or to buy you. But about the loneliness? Don't leave just yet, Johnny. Stay just a f few minutes more. Okay. Just a few minutes. I guess I felt a little sorry for her and her loneliness. Or maybe it was... Well, anyway, I stayed a few minutes more. I think it was just a few minutes. My watch had stopped. First thing in the morning, I tried to get higher on the cab driver on the phone again, but still no answer. I headed for Deputy Sheriff Ansel Garrett's office. Clarence Bixby, who owned the cabin where Russell's body was found, was with him. Good morning, Johnny. Hans, Mr. Bixby. Good morning, Dolly. Anything new? Not much. Well, I won't take up any more of your time, Sheriff. Uh, however, I would like to ask a favor of you, though. What is it? So far, the Denver papers haven't mentioned which cabin up here the body was found in. Now, I'd appreciate it if it could be kept that way. Otherwise, if it got out, I'm afraid my chances of selling the place would be pretty dim. Yeah, and anybody who'd want to buy it for that reason would probably be the kind of person not very welcome here at the lake. Okay, Bixby, sounds reasonable enough. I'll see what I can do. <clears throat> Much obliged, Sheriff. Cigar? No, thanks. Dollar? No, no thanks. Well, I'll see you later, fellas. I'll be around a day or two more if you want me for anything. Okay. Well, how do things look this morning, Johnny? Just like Bixby's cigar wrapper. Hmm? I wish he'd quit tying those things in knots. Every time he does it, it reminds me that we're right in the middle of a knot we can't untie. Yeah. It's a bear, all right. Oh, brother, it's worse than that. A guy named Edward Russell takes off from his home in Denver and disappears. He turns up here looking for a guy named Bill, of which there are too many in this town. Then Bixby brings a prospect up here to show his cabin, too. He finds the padlock's been switched. Russell's body inside. Yeah. Ants, the only person who stood to profit financially on Russell's death is his wife, Leona, beneficiary on his $50,000 insurance policy. Mm -hmm. But she couldn't have killed him. The Denver police established her in Denver at the time. Oh, incidentally, she's up here at the lake now, Johnny. Oh, yeah, she told me over the phone you wanted her to confirm the identification. How'd she bear up? Uh, not too well. It was kind of rough. You got any information out of Betty Norton? Well, her story is she had coffee with Russell after his fracas with the bartender. Hiram, the cab driver, came in and told Russell somebody was looking for him. Russell went away with Hiram. You checked with Hiram? I've been trying to get in touch with him on the phone. No answer. Yeah, he's on the go a lot. He keeps his cab behind the hotel garage. We can check there and leave a message for him. Yeah, okay. Yes. What about Bixby as a possibility? I thought of that too, Johnny. It had taken an awful lot of nerve to kill a guy and then arrange to discover the body in your own cabin, but it sure would be quite a cover. Yeah. yeah but like you say, it'd take more nerve than most men have got. Besides, we run a check on Bixby, and we've turned up absolutely nothing to tie him into the deal at all. You know, there's no evidence he'd ever known Russell. I know. Leona Russell can't remember her husband ever mentioning Bixby's name. I, uh... Hey, wait a minute. How about Putnam? Well, the guy who wanted to buy Bixby's cabin? Yeah. The same thing could apply to him. He knew the cabin was empty. He could have planted Russell's body there and then arranged for Bixby to open the cabin. It could be, except how does he tie in? I don't know. He said he and his wife wanted to buy the cabin. Might be interesting to check with his wife and see what she says. Not a bad idea, Johnny. I'll put in a long-distance call to her. Don't count on much, though. At this point, Ansel, I'm counting on nothing. And I wasn't. I was getting nowhere trying to match a logical motive with any of the suspects. I decided I might as well continue checking guys named Bill around town and see if I could find the one Russell had been looking for. I went down to Bill's boathouse at the landing. Bill Jensen, who ran it, was a stocky, heavyset man in his late 20s. 
His face looked friendly enough. That is, if you weren't paying much attention to his eyes. They were about the coldest shade of blue I'd ever seen. What can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? Boat, maybe? A little information, maybe. What about? A man named Edward Russell. The guy who was murdered? What about him? Did he come around here to your boathouse? Not that I know of. Well, he was looking for a man named Bill, and I thought you might be the one. No. No, Aunt Garrett was telling me about him, but I'm not the one he was looking for. Sorry. Did you have to see him around town anywhere? Russell? Nope. First time I saw him was his picture in the paper after the killing. I see. Hey, you got quite a lot of boats here, Jensen. Yeah, pretty big investment in them. You keep the ones here in the boathouse padlocked, I see. No, I have to. Used to get one stolen now and then. Say, you want to take one out in the lake now, Mr. Dollar? Uh, not right now, Jensen. Maybe later. See you around. All of a sudden, I was real interested in Bill Jensen and his boathouse because some of the padlocks on the boats looked very much like the one that had been placed on Bixby's cabin door, the one he pried off when he discovered Russell's body. I wanted a closer look at those padlocks, but now wasn't the time. I went on back to the hotel to look for Hiram, but his taxi still wasn't there. So I left him a message to contact me as soon as possible. Then, after dark, I went back to the boathouse. There was nobody around. I slipped in the back and took a close look at the boat padlocks. Yeah, no doubt about it. They were the same kind as the one on Bixby's door. And one of them was missing. Yeah, Bill Jensen could be my boy. I hit the deck fast behind one of the boats and looked around me. It was a bad spot to be in. I was pinned against a wall. I edged toward the rear, then dove for the door of the tiny office. Then I realized my mistake. I'd figured that the office would have an outside door, but it didn't. I was trapped. Yeah, it looked like I'd just solved the murder. The hard way. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a shot in the dark that missed, and another that hit the bullseye. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ansel Garrett, Johnny. I was out when you phoned a minute ago. Ants, get over here fast. What's the matter? I'm trapped in the office of Jensen's Boathouse. Trapped? Look, I've got no time to explain. There's a man outside with a gun, and I can't hold him off much longer. Who is it? I don't know, but I've got a strong hunch it's the one who murdered Russell, and he's trying to do likewise to me. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Amalgamated Life Associates, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item seven, two cents. Just about what I figured my life was worth at the moment. The tiny office I was in had no windows and no outside door. A real trap. And outside in the darkened boathouse, somebody with a gun was stalking me. Probably the killer I'd been looking for. But now he was looking for me. I stacked what furniture there was against the door. He started throwing his weight against it. And it couldn't last very long. There was nothing I could do but wait. Right then, the sound of Ants Garrett's voice outside was just about the sweetest music this side of heaven. Drop the gun! Drop it! You okay, Johnny? Yeah, yeah, just a minute. I'll get this stuff away from the door. Okay. Light switch here somewhere. There. Well, Bill Jensen. So you're my boy, Jensen. What are you talking about? What are you doing here anyway, Dollar? Getting shot at by you, mostly. Look, this is my boathouse, remember? You got no business to come prowling around here. Now simmer down, Bill. Simmer down. I thought he was a prowler, Ants. Oh, yeah, sure. You knew I was getting close to you, Jensen. You decided to put me out of the ball game, and you came pretty close, believe me. I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. I figured it was somebody after my boat. Expect again. me to buy a hold story now, like that. Just hold it a second, both of you. If I can get a word in edgewise around here, maybe we can straighten things out. They're pretty straight right now, as far as I can see. Maybe. Bill, you claim you figured Johnny was a prowler trying to steal something, huh? How would you figure it, Ants? I see somebody sneaking into the boathouse and catch a glimpse of somebody else hanging around. Wait a outside. minute, wait a minute. Somebody else who? Man or woman? I couldn't tell. Whatever it was, got out of sight mighty fast. Oh, sure. Pretty convenient story, Jensen. Somebody around here has been keeping an eye on me right from the start. But right now, it figures to be you. Look, Dollar, I'm... Hold it, Bill! A couple of Jensen's boats have turned up missing lately, Johnny. It's natural he might think that you... Yeah, and something else has turned up missing here, too, Ants. What do you mean? That's why I came here to the boathouse tonight in the first place. When I was here this afternoon, I noticed that the padlocks on his boats were missing. One of them was missing. They looked an awful lot like the one that Russell's killer put on the cabin door when he planted the body there. A lock's a lock, Johnny. Yeah, but one of Jensen's is missing. Don't forget that. Oh? Here, come here. Take a look. Right there. Yeah. Yeah, So it is. How about it, Jensen? I didn't even know it was gone. How do I know what happened to it? Somebody stole it. Probably the same guy who stole those boats last month. Look, look, if you're trying to involve me in Russell's murder, you're wasting your time. I didn't even know the guy, and you got nothing to tie me into it. No? Then you better listen to a few facts, Jensen. Edward Russell took off from his home in Denver and came up here to Crystal Lake looking for a guy named Bill, which just happens to be your name. A half a dozen other Bills in town, too, Dollar. Now, what does that prove? Russell's body was found in Bixby's vacant cabin when Bixby brought a prospect up to show him the place. Bixby's lock had been taken off the door and a new one put on. Your padlock, Jensen. I already told you somebody must have stolen it from you. Then I come around to your boathouse here to check on the locks and you start throwing shots at me. You figure it out. You haven't got a case against me and you know it, Dollar. Just the same, Jensen. You better come down to my office with us. I got a few more questions I want to ask you. And I'd like to check your gun against the slug that killed Russell. Go ahead. Check it. Sure, I'll come down with you, Ants. I want to get this straightened out, too. But let me tell you something, Dollar. Next time you come around my boathouse without a search warrant, I won't miss. We questioned Jensen for an hour, but he didn't change his story. He kept denying any connection with the murdered man, Edward Russell, or his wife, Leona. Afterward, Anson and I went into his office. I don't think we got enough to hold him on, Johnny. Yeah. Well, for one thing, his gun's a different caliber than the one that killed Russell. Oh, sure, he could have used a different gun, but we'd have to find it to prove anything. What about the padlock? Mm -hmm. That's a point, all right, but it's our only point. Somebody could have stolen it, like Jensen said. A frame? Could be. (laughs) Jensen sure sticks to his story. (sighs) Yeah. I threw everything I could think of at him, but he didn't crack an inch. Well, after all, Johnny, you were out of line going into his boathouse like that. So I should have had a search warrant. There wasn't time. You know, you got quite a knack for stirring up trouble. If you're wrong about Jensen and the other suspects, you're going to owe a few apologies. Apologies I don't mind handing out. 
But Russell's killer I want. You think I don't? Deputy Sheriff Garrett speaking. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, put it through. It's Mrs. Putnam in Denver, Johnny, wife of the man who wanted to buy Bixby's cabin. Yeah. I put a call into her earlier, hope... You... Hello? Oh, yeah, Mrs. Putnam. This is Deputy Sheriff Garrett up at Crystal Lake. Yeah, the reason I'm calling, your husband tells us you and he had been interested in buying a cabin up here for some time. I thought I'd check with you. What's that? You sure about that? I see. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Mrs. Putnam. Well, I guess your hunches are still clicking, Johnny. She didn't know anything about it, huh? Not a thing. Didn't even know her husband was up here. Look, gentlemen, I've already told you all about it. I saw Bixby's ad in the paper about his cabin here being for sale. It, it sounded like just a thing that... That that you and your wife had in mind, Mr. Putnam? Yes, yes, exactly. So You I... can hold it right there, Putnam. You lied to us. I most certainly did not. Your wife doesn't seem to know anything about it. Oh, my wife? Good Lord, is she up here? No, no, I talked to her on the phone. You, you, you didn't tell her about my wanting to buy the cabin. Yeah, Putnam, I did. You lied, Putnam. And there could be a pretty good reason for it. Look, I... You knew Bixby's cabin was empty. You could have planted Russell's body there and then pretended to want to buy the place so Bixby would open it up and the body would be discovered. It'd make a pretty good cover for you. Oh, gentlemen, please. I'm in enough trouble as it is right now without you piling more on. I had nothing to do with Russell's murder. I didn't even know the man. What do you mean about being in trouble, then? Oh, with my wife. Look, it's probably hard for the two of you to understand... You don't know my wife. Don't know your wife? What about? I did lie about her wanting the cabin. She didn't know anything about it. We know that. I just wanted a place to, well, to get away from her once in a while. Ants looked at me, and I looked at Ants. And I guess we both had the same idea. The idea that we'd run another in a long series of blanks. We heard Putnam out, a long and familiar tale of woe. We could establish no connection between him and the dead man, so we finally left. We left him in the middle of a long sentence about what his wife said to him every time he got home from the office late. Anson and I went outside. The lake was silver in the moonlight, and a million stars were crowding the sky. A good night to be young, but at the moment I was feeling 90 years old. Getting you down, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah, right now I feel like an old beat-up merry-go-round. Hmm. I've been going round and round, and my bearings are getting creaky. Yeah, the trouble is we've checked out just about everybody who could possibly be involved. It's motive that beats me, Ants. The only one we know of to gain by Russell's death is his wife, Leona, beneficiary of his $50,000 insurance policy. Yeah, but the Denver police established her in Denver at the time Russell was killed up here. Yeah, she couldn't have done it. We've got only one more lead as far as I can figure the guy who drives the local taxi here at the lake. Huh? Yeah. He keeps his car right over there in that shed. I know. That's why I was heading this way. Shed's empty, though. Benny Norton told me when she was with Russell the night he got killed, his Hiram came up and told Russell somebody was looking for him, drove him away. Well, Hiram could have a line on the killer. But I can't seem to get a line on Hiram. I've tried to call him half a dozen times. I've left a message for him to contact me, but I haven't had a word from him. I don't like it. Our boys are looking for him. No sign yet. <sighs> well, we're not getting anywhere right now. Hey, look, if you're off duty, Ants, I'll buy you a drink in the hotel room. I am, and you got a deal. Of course, there's one possibility been in the back of my mind all along, Johnny. Yeah, probably in yours, too. You mean the killer could be somebody we don't even know about, a stranger? Yeah. Yeah, those are the toughest ones to crack. I know. Hmm, lobby's kind of crowded tonight. We're getting into the busy season. Mr. Dollar. Hey, it's Leona Russell. Excuse me a minute, Ants. Meet you in the bar. You're right. Good evening, Mrs. Russell. I didn't know you were still here. I'm leaving in the morning. The sheriff asked me to come up here and make an identification of the body. I know. Afterward, I just couldn't seem to get myself organized. I took one of the hotel cottages for a day or two. Such a peaceful spot up here. It's hard to believe... Yes, that... I understand. Uh, Mrs. Russell, your husband came up here apparently looking for a man named Bill. I've questioned two Bills so far, Cullen the bartender and Jensen the boatkeeper. Those names mean anything to you? 
Not that I recall. <laughs> That's what's so terrible about this whole thing, Mr. Dollar. There just doesn't seem to have been any connection between anybody up here and my husband. Why would anyone have done it? That's a good question, Mrs. Russell. And right now, we don't seem to have an answer for it. I went into the bar, but Anne's Garrett was nowhere in sight. The bartender told me he'd been called away. Expense account item eight, 75 cents, one drink. I waited. Still no Garrett. After a while, I went on the back of the hotel to check on Hiram's taxi cab. Nothing. The message I'd left him was still there. I went back into the bar, but Anse didn't show up. Finally, I went up to my room. Johnny Dollar. Anse Garrett, Johnny. Oh, hi. I tried to call you in the bar just now. They told me you'd gone to your room. I got tired waiting for you. Sorry, I got hauled away on official business. I'm calling from a gas station up near the Three Mile Grade. Trouble? Plenty. Johnny, seems like when you go looking for people, it always turns out to be bad luck for them. What do you mean? You came up here looking for Russell. He turned up dead. Now you've been looking for Hiram, the taxi driver. Don't tell me. Afraid so. We just fished his body out of a ravine. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up, the payoff. A payoff with illegal tender. Hot lead. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ansel Garrett, Johnny. I'm calling from a gas station up near the Three Mile Grade, ten miles north of the lake. Trouble? Plenty. Johnny, seems like when you go looking for people, it always turns out to be bad luck for them. What do you mean? You came up here to Crystal Lake looking for Edward Russell. He turned up dead. Now you've been looking for Hiram, the taxi driver. Don't tell me. I'm afraid so. We just fished his body out of a ravine. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Ellis truly, Johnny Dollar.
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is a final accounting of expenses and report of my investigation of the Crystal Lake matter. <laughs> Item 9, $1. Tip to the garage man to get my car out in a hurry. I drove up to the three-mile grade. Deputy Sheriff Ansel Garrett was waiting for me beside the highway and led the way down the ravine. Watch the foot, Johnny. It's pretty tricky. Yeah. Who discovered Hiram's body? One of my boys patrolling the highway. He spotted a glint of metal down here in the moonlight. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. Oh, brother. Taxi cab and all, huh? What a wreck. Yeah. He crashed the guardrail and came down the slope. I doubt if it was an accident, Ance. When a guy's got a bullet hole in his forehead, it's no accident, Johnny. Looks like the same person who killed Russell killed Hiram to shut his mouth. Uh, I guess that's about the size of it. Hiram's murder opens up another keg of nails, Ance. How so? Well, Betty's story is that the last she saw of Russell the night he was murdered was when he drove away in Hiram's taxi. But that story depended on Hiram for confirmation. You'll never be able to confirm it now. Well, earlier tonight you were beat because you were fresh out of suspects, Johnny. Now you got a real live one again. Maybe. But trying to find a motive to fit Betty Norton as a blind alley. The only one who could benefit financially from Russell's death is his wife, Leona. And she was in Denver at the time. I still think Russell's murder ties in with the fact that he came up here looking for somebody named Bill. And apparently had it in for him. Could be. Trouble is, Johnny, we got too many guys by that name at Crystal Lake. Bill Cullen, the hotel bartender. Bill Jensen at the boathouse. Both of them are still possibilities, Ants. The bartender had a fight with Russell on the night of the murder. And it was one of Bill Jensen's padlocks on the cabin where the body was found. Yeah, that's true enough. Whoever killed Russell and hid his body in Bixby's vacant cabin didn't know that Bixby was planning on selling the place and would bring somebody up to show it and discover the body. Sounds real convincing, Johnny. Now all you have to do is figure out somebody's name for the whoever and a good motive, and you're all set. Oh, yeah, sure. Real simple. You know one thing that's been bothering me from the start, though? Why did the killer plant Russell's body in a cabin? With all the wide open spaces around here, why a cabin? Yeah, you could have figured dogs or animals would uncover the body if it was outside somewhere. How about the lake? The bodies have a way of coming to the surface. Yeah, I guess you're right. If we could only have gotten to hire him before this. You happen to know where he lived? No, a little rooming house not far from the hotel. You through here? No, not yet, Johnny. I got a couple of my boys beating the bush around here. Okay, I'll head back to town and see if I can turn up anything of interest at Hiram's rooming house. <laughs> On the way back to the village, I stopped at Betty Norton's Lakeshore Mansion, but she wasn't at home. Her housekeeper told me she'd gone to Denver for a couple of days. On hearing that, my interest in her as a suspect shot up again. Expense account item 10, $1.45, long-distance call to the Denver police, requesting them to try to locate Betty Norton for further questioning. Then I went to the rooming house where Hiram had lived. I couldn't find anything in his room that would give me a lead on his killer. But as I was coming out, I found someone in the hall who might. Huh? Well, Bill the bartender. Oh, hello, Dollar. What are you doing here? It's real simple. I live here. Oh, same rooming house as Hiram, huh? That's right. Now, look, don't go trying to tie me into his murder. We was friends. I didn't know the news of his killing was out. How did you know he was dead, Bill? Well, I, I, I just talked to one of Vance Garrett's boys at the hotel. He told me. Oh, I see. No, you don't say, Dolly. You still fight. Look, Johnny. whoever killed Hiram is the same one who killed Russell. You had a fight with Russell on the night of his death. Yeah, well, I explained that to you before. He was looking for somebody named Bill. He thought I was the one, got tough about it. But that's all there was to it. I didn't kill him. I didn't kill Hiram. You'll never prove it I did. Yeah, going round and round on the merry-go-round. Somewhere along the line, I must have missed something. But I didn't know what. I decided to go back and start from the beginning. In this case, Bixby's cabin, where Russell's body was discovered. I found Bixby in the hotel bar. Hi, Dollar. Care for a drink? No, no thanks, Bixby. Well, I got a little good news earlier this evening. Sheriff Garrett told me he was through checking over my cabin so I can get it cleaned up and repainted now. You gonna advertise it again? Yeah, yeah, I'm not too optimistic about my chances of selling it, though. Even though the location of it's been kept out of the papers, everybody at Crystal Lake here knows about it. Uh, 
You never found out who put that new padlock on the door, huh? Oh, the lock came from Jensen's boathouse. But we haven't been able to tie in Bill Jensen with any of the rest of it. Look, Bixby, you mind if I take another look around your cabin? Not at all, Dolly. You want me to go with you? No, that won't be necessary. Okay. Here's the key. Help yourself. It was my last chance. Maybe there was something in the cabin that neither Ansel Garrett nor I had noticed before. Something, anything that would give me a lead. I spent an hour going through it inch by inch, and I drew a great big blank. Everything was in place. Nothing had been touched. Even my cigarette butt on the front porch and Bixby's cigar wrapper twisted in a knot where we'd sat and talked after he'd reenacted the discovery of Russell's body. Inside, only marks on the floor where Ansel Garrett's boys had measured the distance of the body from the door, stuff like that. But as far as anything that would give me a fresh lead, there was nothing, nothing at all. I was licked and I knew it. Mr. Dollar. Good evening, Mrs. Russell. I just dropped in to say goodbye. Well, that was very thoughtful of you. Please come in. Thanks. When are you leaving? I'm checking out in the morning. What are your plans? I'm not sure, Mr. Dollar. I'll probably get rid of the house in Denver and take an apartment for a while. After that, I, I don't know. Have you filed your claim yet on your husband's insurance policy? No, not yet. My lawyer will take care of it for me. I'd rather not have any more to do with things like that personally than I can help. Mr. Dollar, have you gotten anywhere with your investigation? Have you found anyone at all who could have had a reason to kill my husband? To tell you the truth, Mrs. Russell, up to now I've got no... Then I saw it. Something in Leona Russell's room. Just a little thing. But all of a sudden, the whole deal slid neatly into place. But I had to be sure... Somehow, I had to start the ball rolling and see what happened. You were saying, Mr. Dollar? Oh, yeah. I, I was saying that up to now, I haven't been able to get any... Uh, what time is it? Well, um, well, a quarter to ten. Oh, I gotta make a phone call. Mind if I use your phone? Well, uh, no, not at all. I was supposed to call Deputy Sheriff Garrett to check on a new lead. And uh, if it's panned out, looks like we're in. Deputy Sheriff Garrett. Johnny Dollar, Ants. Uh, how's that new lead look? Huh? What new lead? Yeah, good. Hey, what are you... Oh, maybe putting on an act for somebody, Johnny? That's right. Well, looks like we're on the right track at last. Uh, you can't beat a lab test. Thanks, Ants. Something new has developed, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Looks like we're finally closing in on the right man, Mrs. Russell. I gotta run now. Got a date with the sheriff. But I'll keep you posted. I went outside her hotel cottage and waited. I could hear her on the phone. In a moment, she came out, started along the trail near the lakeshore. I followed. I was sure I was finally getting close to Russell's killer. But then a gun barrel on my back told me I'd gotten a little too close. Hold it, Dollar. Well, Mr. Bixby. Surprise? As a matter of fact, no. Bill? Is that you, Bill? Dollar. Hello, Leona. Leona, you stupid little... Falling for a gag like Dollar just pulled on you. But I had to talk to you, to warn you. Looks like you're a little stupid too, Bixby. Huh? I just spotted one of them in Leona's cottage. I told you I should never have come to your cottage, Leona. You insisted. I had to see... That's what threw me about you, Bixby. Clarence Bixby, but a middle name of William, huh? Wilford, if it'll do you any good now. It was you and Leona right from the start. Her husband found out about it, but all he had to go on was the name Bill. Somehow he got a lead that brought him up here to Crystal Lake. Of course I arranged for him to get the lead. Yeah. You wanted to be easy to find. You had Hiram, the taxi driver, decoy Russell to you, then killed Hiram to shut his mouth. Bill, get rid of him. Then you killed Russell in your own cabin and left his body. I had to. The people in the next cabin moved in that night. I was afraid they'd see me if I moved the body. So you played it smart. You stole a padlock from Bill Jensen to throw suspicion on him. Then you advertised your cabin and discovered the body when a prospect wanted to see the place. A pretty neat cover, Bixby. You had a lot of nerve. I still have, Dolly. Enough to do what has to be done now. And sweet little Leona Russell, the poor grieving wife. In it with you, right from the start. Hurry up and do it, Bill. Then you and I can get... Oh, no, that's where you're wrong, Leona. 
It's not going to be you and I anymore. Bill, you can't say that. You engineered the whole deal right from the start, and I'm sick of it. I'm getting out. You can't get out, Bill. You hear me? You can't. You're in this as deep as I am, oh, and you... Oh, yes. I can get out all right, Leona. I know one good way. Oh, yes, I've used it before, and it works. Here's for you, baby. Bill, no! Bill! He swung the gun toward her. I drove at him, but too late. Oh, oh Bill! I hit him twice oh. in the face and oh. went down. I bent over Leona, but she was gone. She must have been dead when she hit the ground. Eleventh and final item on expense account, $145.20. Transportation and incidentals from Crystal Lake home. Total expenses, $423 even. Remarks about Bixby. In jail, awaiting trial on three counts of murder. Edward Russell, Hiram, Leona Russell. About Leona, who'd engineered the whole deal for a payoff. Well, she got paid off, all right. End of remarks, end of report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, beginning on Friday night, because I'm sure you'll want to listen to the Republican convention Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week, a simple string of beads, and each bead on it, a motive for murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Dick Crenna, Charlotte Lawrence, Gene Tatum, Howard McNear, Forrest Lewis, and Herb Ellis. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Remember, next week's story will start on Friday night because of the Republican convention on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So join us Friday, a week from tonight, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com.